Today, I'm with John Mason, a professional storyteller from Brighton in England. I've seen him perform a number of times. I've been so engrossed by his tales of myth, legend, and old charter that I thought um, I'd bring you in, if you're interested in storytelling, to see a storyteller's side of storytelling. So welcome to Crick and Fold, John Mason. Hello, thank you very much for having me. Very welcome, very welcome. So straight into the questions, why do you think storytelling is so special? Wow, that's a brilliant question to start with. Um, I think well, I, can, I can go two different ways with this. And and the, the, the first one, the most fundamental one is that um, we all just love stories, I think. Or at least, I, you know, I, I believe that we do. And people who, for whatever reason, say they don't, I'm, I'm always kind of suspicious of. Um, but um, I, I think they're, they're, they're missing something, really. Um, the, the, or, uh, missing some understanding of, of, of how their, their own imagination works. Uh, yeah, we human beings... On a very fundamental psychological level, we we exist to we to, to tell stories. We make sense of the experiences we have and the world around us by creating stories about it, and then we share those with other people. Even you know, in just what you did with your day, or or why you have to worry about crossing the road or whatever. Um, and and so stories of all forms are just all around us, and that's a vital part of any whether you just call it entertainment or or culture to get to give it a more more of a sense of gravitas really um uh movies telly songs radio the news everything is it takes the form of a story and and uh i love the way when when academics use the phrase our intellectual architecture um in what, whatever um cultural setting we're immersed in is constructed through stories from the bible classical tradition from science and the story of how different things were invented and also from star wars and the mcu and you know everything it, um it's all around us um so yeah and and the other way that i can answer that question is is that storytelling the way that i do it as an oral um thing which um until the days of zoom um and everything came to save us, um, then I would be doing it in front of a live audience, just me. Um, and venues would always be surprised at exactly how lo-fi it is, that I don't turn up with props or lighting or kit, it's just me. That is quite an unusual thing these days. And although, you know, it's lovely to have the digital medium to to share it in at the moment, and I hope to carry on doing that alongside live stuff, um, you can see in people's faces and especially kids faces that um simply having nothing between them and the story but somebody's voice somebody's face and actions and their own imagination and building the whole picture and the whole setting and scenario from that is is something that they don't get the chance to do these days and and it really broadens their experience and i've had teachers tell me that as well when i've done sessions in schools so um Two two good reasons why storytelling is important. Yeah, I also like a true storyteller as well. <laughs> so, yeah. There um, might be others watching. I've got to you know <laughs> keep, keep the team up. So how then? Because that sounds like quite a a challenging task to do. So how does someone like yourself get into storytelling? What is the trigger point? Yeah, well, I I, I do. I I can think of really big important steps in the development of my interests but I also find it hard to answer that question because I, I just can't remember a time when I didn't know that there was such a thing as a storyteller but in saying that I should say it's not like I grew up getting to go and see lots of people telling stories orally um, in fact I, I don't know if I ever really did actually but um, I've always just loved um myths and legends of all kinds and i've loved fantasy fiction and historical fiction um and i'm a huge history nut um and so in all of that then there was always the storyteller that 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 was a, a part of the world um that all of these things have um and yeah and so as my interest in mythology grew then i was just more and more aware that that was there um so, so I, I can sorry yeah, go on yeah what was, what was the story then that triggered this well that, yeah that's, that, that's exactly what i was going to say that i i um 
I know that there were big things that, that really brought me there. And the big one that I always mention um, is when I was in year seven. So um, that in, in that's in UK schools, that's um, about first year of secondary school. So about 11 years old. Um, then I discovered in my school library a picture book of the Mabinogion, which is uh, um, a cycle of medieval legends from Wales. And it just completely blew me away because it, it, it was stories from Britain. And up until that point, then I knew little bits of fragments of stories from Britain. But in terms of the big bodies of mythology, then it was always Greek and Norse, really, were the ones that you came across um, where I was at that time. And to find that there was something equivalent to that, and it really is equivalent to that, but from this arbitrary patch of soil that happens to be called Britain. Um, it just completely blew me away. And and what really helped as well that was that I've had family in North Wales since I was very young, since I was four years old. And a lot of these stories actually it was from Wales, which I loved. It was a Welsh language, which I loved, but it actually referred to specific places in the Welsh landscape, which I knew as well. And so it was that real personal connection. And from that, I just went on to try and find out as much as I could about Welsh myth and, and Celtic speaking myth more more widely and, and just never looked back. Okay, so um, the other big myth you may have been familiar with as a child then is King Arthur and, and Merlin. Uh, so you, you mentioned before, you talked about a story where you're talking to your mum. And she said, yes, yes. No, I, I, I know I could have said that. Now I didn't want to didn't want to ramble on too much. But um, but that that was another big thing, which probably actually happened a couple of years before that, um, which was. Well, so this would have been uh, the late 80s. And my mum had been reading the Mary Stewart novels about Merlin. Um, which I know a lot of people love quite rightly. I think they're amazing. Um, if you haven't read them, find them. Um, but um, yeah, so th they were very much set in the immediate post-Roman Britain and trying to trying to sort of ground the Arthurian tradition in in a sense of of lived real history. Um, and um, yeah, I can't remember how Arthur came up in the conversation we were having me and my mum just sat in the parked car in a car park in wokingham in in berkshire um and in in, in england suburban thames valley and um mum said to me but but you know it, all that was true and i just thought what well, that, that that's crazy because uh, all i knew at that stage of king arthur was the high medieval plumes and shining armor and knights errant and everything um and mum said well actually it was it was all hundreds of, years, hundreds of years earlier than that. It was like just after the Roman rule of Britain had ended um, and very different social context. Um, but there was actually a historical beginning to it all. And the idea that, that this fabulous, fantastical stuff might actually be real was it just that, that also. I just felt like the, the floor opened up from underneath me. And, and so... So yeah, in parallel with with my interest of Mabinogion, then I was really interested in Arthurian stuff, and of course the two actually intertwine very closely in medieval texts and modern fictions. So um, it it was it was heaven, it really was. And obviously, what I know now is that the historicity of Arthur is entirely contested, and and um, what Mary Stuart was doing was taking Geoffrey of Monmouth's medieval work which was you know, largely fictional but very good fiction um and trying to sort of retell that in a historically valid plausible setting um and she did a spectacular job of it um but um yeah the the, the process of learning all that has been incredibly good fun yes yes i, I must admit I, I can empathize with that in fact, <laughs> stuff is real as you say with the connection with the maybe not be on yeah, you know, that connection with King Arthur when I went to Cornwall as a child. That really, <sighs> yes, you know, Tintagel, I think it was, and they've got Merlin's Cave and, and the castle there, Arthur's seat. Yeah. But so, yeah, I totally get where you're coming from that feeling. So that brings a, an interesting point in storytelling. And you said you're a, a historian at heart. So how do you tread the line in, in telling, let's say, a story about Arthur and balancing what you think is history and potentially 
making a two hour documentary on the history of Arthur versus a two hour fairy tale on all the magic of, of Arthur. How, how do you balance the history and the, the myth? Yeah, and it is something of a challenge. It, it, it's not always easy. Um, uh, I, I've I've said to you before, I sometimes find myself stumbling into it becoming more of a lecture, um, or at least I did when I first started storytelling like really consistently. Um, and I had to be very wary of that. My, my son especially was a really good barometer for that. Um, it, as soon as it stopped being a story, fun, entertaining, and was just somebody giving you a, a, a vocal discussion of facts, then he'd say, that that, that got a bit boring, Dad. Um, so um, that was really helpful. Um, but um, yeah, I guess what I try and do about it these days is I think I'm fortunate in that one of the things that I've come to be most interested in with history is the history of um, of how people think and how people what people believe, really. Um, and so when I'm studying mythology and researching stories, then I do feel like I'm actually still studying history. I'm just studying the history of what people thought about cosmology and existence at a particular point in time um and so really when i'm when i'm building up to doing a a storytelling um thing where i want it to be a story then i'll learn as much as i can about the historical context of the story um and then when i tell the story then elements of that will kind of ground it and sink in um without it being overt really um I sorry you're gonna say something I was gonna say, so is it like a you have a a map of the story and there's lots of places on the map but you decide to journey through particular places as you tell the story that's a really good way of putting it yeah and that that's that's actually extraordinarily close to one of the um the bits of advice on on building stories in any media um that i that's really lodged in my mind which came from um a book on how to write for comics by alan moore who wrote Viva vendetta and watchmen and and all those um uh amazing you know godfather of of intelligent comic writing um and in his book then he he talks about you know work out he says it's the difference between um what happened and the plot um or i think you might put it like the difference between the story and the plot um and in that in that schema then the plot would be all the different things that happened in chronological order but the story is how you choose to cut across them mm -hmm. so just like you say you know you find uh the path from a to b um that is actually most satisfying um and and evokes the story in the way that you want it to really or even if it means you actually start at d and um work your way around by a very circuitous route it's, yeah that's really cool okay so let's talk about maybe a more specific challenge then because um i'm reading the the maybe now um mm -hmm. i'll buy you to say so Good stuff. <laughs> i hope you're enjoying it yeah lots of lots of little stories bouncing in yeah and quite some quite horrific detail going in on on how uh, they can be <laughs> yes it's it's, uh, it's life in the raw yeah but what does surprise me is how to pronounce some of the names so, for example, because it's sort of old Britain or Welsh orientated, some of the names I just don't pronounce. I have my own nicknames for them in my head because I just how you know, Welsh looks a language of L's and W's and CH's and things like that. So do, do you try and uh, tell the story with the real names or do you sort of adjust names like that? How do, how do you get oh no definitely tell them the the real the real way yeah uh i think it's, it's um it's part of the um it's part of the culture that it came from and i want people to, you know the language does really color the experience i think just because of the sound the music and the 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 the, the tonal qualities of, of the of the words um add to the to the atmosphere i think um and so just to be just for that reason alone, and and to be true to it, then I do try and get it right um, where I can. I, I I don't really speak Welsh. Shadad um, Dippenbach, and that's about the extent of, of my Welsh. <laughs> but I I love the feel of it. I I went to university in Bangor in North Wales, and so um, it's very um, and and like I said, my family there are in North Wales as well. It's and that that northwestern corner Gwynedd is is 
it is very much the, the the heartland of Welsh language, and and so it was all around me, and I just love the the sound of it, and I and I love, I love. I love language as a as a, as a form. As a, I, I love learning languages and and getting my vocal apparatus around unusual sounds. It's fun. Um, there have been times when I have sort of been umming and ahhing over um, whether I should change names, um, but that was more for for interestingly for sort of historical reasons. Like you say, like there, there have been a couple of um, big storytelling things I've done where I do intertwine very overtly. Um, uh, historical and archaeological facts with stories, um, and one of those is is an attempt. It's called the show's called Root Branch and Weave, and it's an attempt to um, dig into the the possibilities of um, ancient British creation myth, and a lot of that is drawn from um, the Mabinogion and parallel stories in Irish tradition. Um, and when I've been doing that sort of thing, and especially when I've been doing that sort of thing for schools then um then i've sort of as you drill down through different diff the text at different points in history then you come to different iterations of the same names so as the language is developed so um the classic one is uh, a character who in welsh medieval legends is known as cleave silverhand which is spelled double l u double d cleave um and actually, uh, his name is derived, and, and this has been sort of quite reasonably argued by um, linguistic scholars. His name came from Nodens, which sounds utterly different, um, which uh, was a Romano-British god worshipped at a shrine um, at Lydney in Gloucestershire, uh, among other places as well. Um, and the idea is that you go from Nodens to Lidans, and I could explain why it's all very long and complicated. Um, Nodans to Lidans um, to um, Lid to Hliv. And actually, as an offshoot of that tradition, then you get the, um, the idea that London was founded by a mythical king, Lud, um, uh, which still retained that sound in the anglicized tradition that sprang off from that. And he appears in Geoffrey of Monmouth and all sorts. Um, and so when I've been doing that, then I've been thinking, well, where do I stop in, in that line? Do I call him Schlieve because that's what he is in the latest medieval Welsh version of it? Do I go for Lud because I've got a justification for that and it's more easily understood if I'm performing to an English audience? Do I go for Nodens? Um, and there's no easy answer, but I tend to go for Schlieve actually just because, again, it just feels more true to the Welsh material that I, I came to this all with. Yeah, no, I can again emphasize with that too. So when I talk about Old Norse, I tend to use the Old Norse pronunciations. Right. Odin rather than Odin. Ah, now it's really interesting you say that because actually when I do Norse stories, which I, I, I've come to in more recent years, then I, I'm, I vacillate a lot more actually on wh how to pronounce things. And, and I, I, I think what I find is if it's a name that I've only recently come across, um like uh hervor um in the 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 um saga of um hervor and Heidrek, um then i'm more likely to want to use the norse version i'm enjoying the language of it but if it's something i've known since childhood or or which is very commonly known then i'm more likely to say sigurd okay. rather than sigurd yeah. Or um, or Odin Loki rather than Odin Luca that sort of thing, um, and partly that partly that is just a, a sort of pragmatic compromise because most of the audience, if I started talking about Odin and Luca, they're going to go, "What? Who, who, is it? who are these guys? I don't understand." Um, so it is a. I feel a little bit ashamed of myself when I do that, but on the other hand, you want to bring people in, exactly. give give them things to hang on to. Talents. I don't know. Basically, I'm. A, wholly inconsistent and can't claim any sort of authority yeah you're like a true storyteller basically. yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the north is interesting as well so um there's a lot of ballads in fact across europe uh, and and poems because singing poems is an easier way to remember a story than a story itself although remembering stories is easier than just remembering facts you know it just it just seems to be an evolution of better way so do you have you ever thought about trying ballads or, or to sort of retain the poetic? 
I really have. I, I really have. Um, I, uh, I, I enjoy telling the stories of Taliesin, who is um, a sort of quasi-historical um, Welsh bard, who there's a, there's a wonderful mythic story about him. And a lot of it is couched in the most vivid, amazing poetry. Really, like, it's almost psychedelic at times in this, in terms of its sort of mind expanding kind of take on existence um and and a lot of it is very important to the story there are bits where, where at various stages then the youthful taliesin declaims a poem which illustrates what he's doing at a certain point and and i i've, I've got to admit that my my memory for learning by rotes like that just isn't quite up to it yet even after all these years of storytelling i try i really i'm, I'm trying to hone it I do. I enjoy telling stories about Herne the Hunter. I have a particular take on Herne the Hunter because I because I grew up in, in in Berkshire, not far from Windsor, where where he's supposed to hang around. So uh, I've always enjoyed that. Um, and for that, then I worked really hard at learning the passage from Shakespeare, um, which is our earliest actual documentary reference to Herne the Hunter. Um, and my son again really helped, and I was I was sort of pacing the kitchen. I try and you know on a very pop psychology channel four kind of way i i i i try and follow what people say about you know actual oral traditions in societies where that is still the main means of handing down information and so i i try and be physically active and walk with a rhythm or, or rock while i'm while i'm trying to remember the stuff i guess it kind of helps so so again back to say i don't know if you you know so norse poetry has got a lot of alliteration in it and so in the Voluspa particularly, there are two great examples where that actually makes the poem. So uh, near the start, one of the first verses, uh, it talks about the creation of the world. And they want you to imagine um, a beach with the waves slowly coming in. It talks about the sand and the sea and the sky and it like the sound of, of waves pointing out. Ah. And at the end, it talks about Fenrir and Ragnarok and rrr, and this rrr sound, which if you can speak old doors properly, unlike myself, you get the grrr all the way through the verse of the poem as though the wolf is there. And that, I don't know, are there examples like that you're aware of in in the poetry you, you know or the stories you know? Oh, well, I, yes, yes. I, I mean, certainly, I mean, most of when I'm learning stories, I like to go back to the original sources as much as I can. And so I, I read English translations of the Old Norse um, um, texts and things to, to, to really soak up the tale. Um, uh, but are you thinking that in terms of how I bring it into the telling? Well, well just the stories you know. So I may say my focus tends to be more Germanic Norse, where you know a lot of Britain. Uh, mm, I uh, see, because, yes. Where there's uh, parts of poetry in in the stories you know that have special attributes that make more towards the story yeah that, 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 well it's interesting actually i mean um the 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 you know, i i i would love to know a lot more than i do about medieval welsh poetry i, I know the mabinogion and associated stories um but the, the poetry that i've most looked at from that tradition is uh, the Taliesin poems. It's uh, supposedly written by him, or at least written by later poets, kind of adopting a persona um, for the for the sake of a given piece of work. And the way that's written, it's actually it can, in terms of trying to learn a story from it, it's incredibly challenging to to a modern audience. Um, it, it, there most of those poems are real sort of declamations of something but i don't think that experts would say i was getting it that wrong to say it's it's usually very hard to say exactly what is being said it's something very important it, it tends to start off with an awful lot of you want poetry i'm the best that's yeah come to me all those other poets they ain't nothing J just like an mc but in in a slightly different you know linguistic mode but that's essentially what it comes down to um but um 
apart from that, it, there are allusions to events in stories, some of which we recognize from the Mabinogion. So um, there's a, a very famous Taliesin poem called The Battle of the Trees, which in amongst all the, the looping surrealistic language, it talks about Gwydion and Hlei, who are two characters um, from the fourth branch of the Mabinogi. And um, it, it refers to them fighting a battle in a way which is reminiscent of a war that Gwydion starts in the Mabinogi. Um, but in, in the Mabinogion, he's fighting against South Wales. He's fighting against Duved, the kingdom in the south. In this poem, he's actually fighting against the other world, the, the, the world of gods and spirits. And, and the main antagonist is named as, as um, if I think I'm remembering this right, I think it does name him as Araun, who's the king of the other world in the Mabinogi. Um, and... And in the course of this battle, then Gwydion um, is said to bring trees to life to fight on their behalf, which is such a brilliant image. And it's reminiscent of something that happens in a, in a sort of broadly similar, slightly similar anyway, old Irish myth. Um, but that doesn't happen in the Mabinogion. Um, and so you get these tantalizing glimpses, basically, presumably because the audience of these poems at the time were assumed to already know these stories yes, yes. and and so they they aren't explained because the i because the he, you know he, he would sort of say like when Gwydion did this he showed his mastery of knowledge of how nature works and i've got that too kind of thing um but but, but yeah the, the actual story itself is 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 only very very obliquely referred to really so it's very frustrating so passage so cause there's, there's some of that in old norse myth too like there's the assumption that you know, lots of poems have been lost and that they're assumed so if you had a time machine john if i gave you the opportunity to, go to, <laughs> to one place and, and grab a story that you know you haven't got the text of Story? Oh, is there a story you you would love to know about? Or oh gosh, yes, yes, there really is. Yeah, um, I'd want I'd want to know what the mythological antecedents of the Mabinogion were. Um, that's what I'd really want to know, and I'd want to know um, how to. So many angles I could approach that from. I mean, one thing would be Geoffrey of Monmouth. Um, to, for people who don't know, Geoffrey of Monmouth was an Anglo-Norman. Uh, well, he was, he was sort of Anglo-Welsh, really, um, and in Norman times, um, uh, cleric who um, wrote a book claiming to be a history of the kings of Britain, and it's largely fiction, but it's glorious, and uh, and it was one of the main things that kick-started the romantic literature about Arthur in medieval times. Um, but uh, he always claimed in, in, in his sort of introduction to, to the work, he says that he had been given or come across a certain very old book in the British tongue, um, which he drew all of this history, which he'd recited from. Uh, and um, people have said over the years, did he just make that up? Was that just part of the fiction? Was that some sort of spurious um, justification for what he was saying? Or was there a very old book? And if there was, then it, I, I, yeah, it would be kind of interesting to see that. Um, but I suppose ultimately, I mean, what, why, why I'm interested in a lot of that stuff is because it, it, with the Mabinogion, it was written in medieval times, and I think it's very important for people to remember that. Um, some scholars these days even go so far as to say it, 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 pfft, any any suggestion of of gods and mythology underneath that should just be ignored. And I think that's going a bit too far. But that you know. However much it is a product of medieval times, it was certainly drawing on older traditions and whether or not they were written or just purely oral, oral then I want to know exactly what was being said hundreds of years before that about the gods of, of the British Isles. I agree. I'd love to, yeah, that's a period that really fascinates me. <laughs> so, so let's talk more about storytelling itself, because I'm sure there's people here, myself included, who want to wants to be able to tell stories a lot better than they do. Um, my, my channel is about storytelling, about events rather than reading the stories. I don't know, something. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. What makes a good storyteller? How, what, you know, what, how? Oh, yeah, that, that's a good question. Yeah, uh, yes. Good. Uh, well, 
to start with, there's lots of different styles of telling. Yeah, everybody's got their own individual way of doing it. And I think I think a lot of the best stuff really comes from just finding a, a voice of your own and letting that come out um, rather than trying to just um, purely just, just do what you think other people have done by the book. Um, that said, uh, I, I will happily and proudly own that um, I got better at storytelling by watching other people, um, uh, particular people that, are, that I am very, very indebted to. Uh, um, a chap called Richard Beard, uh, who tells stories under the name of Story Beard, and a woman called Lisa Kenwright um who i would just sit and watch at a storytelling circle that they used to run in brighton and just think i can see what you did there that's really good and ah oh, that the way that she put you know that little inflection at the end there that oh that's wonderful and i just tried to sort of absorb those lessons um and another storyteller i should always um give thanks to on these occasions is ruth cook who was involved in the same circle who who was a really good mentor for me sitting down and talking through the story with me um, and how I was telling it and giving advice. Um, and that really shaped things for me. I think in terms of what makes a good storyteller, the first thing that really stuck out for me when I was watching Richard Storybeard, that made me think that's what you need in order to be good, was a, a sense of um, being able to convey the idea that you really believe what you're saying. That all this crazy stuff that you're coming out with, um, you're talking about it as if it really happened. Um, and I think part of that comes actually from just a sheer sense of play, of enjoying it of, for, uh, internally, however however grim or sad or, or, or poignant or whatever you're saying, however you're saying it, whatever story you're telling. Inside, I suppose, for me, I feel like there's there's maybe an element all the time of a bit of a twinkle in your eye of, of, of just having a bit of fun of, of completely just just playing yourself and playing with the audience um and and that certainly was what enabled me to be able to look someone in the eye and say with a completely straight face that um you know that the the emir was um brought down by the gods because the gods looked up Odin and his brothers looked up and like all powerful people are when they see something more powerful than themselves they were afraid and they didn't want to be afraid and so they tried to get rid of the thing that they were afraid of um and um yeah it, it, it's I'm sure yeah that that was an example off the top of my head and I'm I, I, I dare say I could do better if I <laughs> stopped and thought about it so, so to me you make stories out of the little facts that I just think are facts. You know, to me, I was invented really uh, really well, where you actually make it into a story that oh, they saw Emir as a primordial being who had more power than them. And so they felt they had to. And so you had this, that element to it. And that's the thing you, and so you. I suppose it. so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess what I try, what I, what I do just because I like doing this and I do this when, when I, when I watch a film or I read a book as well, as I, I, I always imagine the characters as if they were real people. I was, you know, their, their, their lives don't stop where the text ends or the scene ends or whatever. And I, and I, uh, and, and when I sort of, if I'm thinking about a story that I've enjoyed, then I'll think, oh no, they wouldn't have done that, would they? Because they were heartbroken or, you know, that sort of thing. And, and so it's the same when I try and tell a story, I, I, without even thinking about it, I, I'm trying to get inside the heads of the characters, whether it is Odin and Nimir or, or whether it's the Squire of Hendy, um, which is another story I love telling, which is much more local real life scale. Um, and, and, um, and one of the ways of doing that is to, is to, read as much as you can about them and think about it from all sides, really. Um, and try and, again, try and make believe that it's all true, really. So we've got the the text um, from the, the, the Eddas that tells us about Emir and the creation of the Norse world um, in conflicting versions. So let's try and come up with a version that feels historically authentic as best as anybody can. And um, just because that's what matters to me, just because I'm, I'm interested in that, but also one that's satisfying as a story. And then once you've done that, then 
you're just trying to, yeah get into it from on an emotional level and think about the motivations of the characters and 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 sometimes in and, and as you'll know from medieval texts you're presented with the most what seem to us now as crazily bizarre non secateurs of uh, suddenly you know and then they stayed there for seven years um but then on the seventh year then they rose up in anger and cut their wife's head off or, you know and it's uh, it's just a different mode of of telling stories that that we're that seems a bit alien now and so when presented with that then you have to sort of think okay right what do i know it's a person there was this going on why would they respond like that well maybe they were angry you know yeah <laughs> does that help <laughs> You made me think of lots of different things. Like the the older stories also tend to tell you the end or hint at the end at the very beginning, mm. uh, rather than the modern stories we tell today, where mm. they want to keep the ending secret until the end. Yes, yeah. And I don't but, know that's why people thought like that. That's interesting to me. It is, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know if you know. You you probably have as many possible explanations for that as i do really I, mean, I guess it could it be something to do with these being stories which they heard a lot and so everybody knew them and they understood that these stories this body of story was their their past in a way which which we're not so immersed in really but, yeah yes yeah that that probably aligns to how I feel they, they've heard the stories a lot and therefore they don't care what the end is they the end tells them what story it is yes yeah yeah maybe yeah absolutely yeah that's a really good way of looking at it yeah yeah it's it's uh, and 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 when people talk about the sort of the mythic content the quality of a story that gives it some sort of powerful emotional lesson almost or resonance um a lot of the writers who who written at length about that they they, they will talk about how the, these stories would have been heard lots of times and recognized as the reason why we do what we do about this the reason why we follow this pattern of behavior the reason why we enact this ritual um and so again the the ending of the story is already part of the reason we're telling it isn't it exactly yes, yes. yeah that's interesting well wow. cool so um so other tips for storytelling, if people know, he says, how do you practice? Do you have a, a special technique in to remember a story? Do you, do you read it a million times or do you have a magic way of just reading it once? And, and... <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it depends. Uh, and everybody's again, everybody's different. Um, I'm crap at practicing. Excuse my language. I, I find it very, very hard um, to the the element of of performance of of basically showing off which is what it comes down to um and and there's, i feel like i am putting on a notional mask when i do that i just i can't do that when there isn't an audience and so the the idea of having to actually sort of evoke that and go through it when i'm just talking to a wall or or worse still talking to my family who you know, know me better than anybody and trying to put a mask between me and them just feels embarrassing, really. Um, yeah, yeah I, I find that very, very difficult. Um, so when I've worked with other storytellers, um, like Rachel Levy, who runs South Down Storytellers, then she's been very good at, you know, sort of saying, no, look, come on, we're working together on this now. We, we need to be disciplined and encouraging me to just give it a go. And, and it's really a question of sort of pushing through this horrible, embarrassing bit when you're sitting there looking at your friend um and trying to act like you're doing something special um but it's worth it um because the more you tell the story then the more confident you are and i think that confidence is an enormous part of what gives you that sense of being able to tell it as if you believe it um because it's it's all there at your fingertips and even if you don't have to mention every single detail um you but because you've got them all at your fingertips then you can pick out the ones that matter on that particular day, on that particular telling. Um, yeah, so so practice, practice is worth it, definitely. There are ways to sort of break yourself into it, which I think uh, are, can be really helpful. Like um, like with Rachel, then she suggested, um, don't try and tell the story as if it's the performance, but just tell it as if you were talking to a friend in the pub or a cafe or, or in your front room or whatever. So just... Um, 
so so there's this guy and and um he's he's been brought up by a smith who tells him there's this dragon and he can go and get the treasure but he's going to need a special sword so they try and make a sword and he keeps testing it and it breaks and you know it doesn't it's not the story but it gets you used to saying it out loud um and and it gets and it, and it just beds in the, the the knowledge of what happens really um and and you can break that down even further so some people like to do things like um i i, I was on a course about telling for heritage um and um one of the two, two storytellers who ran that dave tong um he had us um writing down a story in seven bullet points um and that helps you focus in well what are the important emotional beats in this narrative what what really matters and then if you want you can go down to five or three you know um and um and that's a good way of sort of yeah grounding yourself in it and, and giving you a bit of practice um or even do, 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 like give, timing yourself a minute and drawing it all out in stick figures um and those are good things to then refer back to as well um and and just to do the more you do that the more you sort of you close in on what's what really matters in this story and you feel like you know what really matters and then when you tell it and again you might forget details but you will remember enough to to convey what really matters yeah. which is good so uh the other thing then people want to know as a storyteller is how do you find your stories how do you do your research yeah they're like a special book of stories you could just go to and oh there's one or <laughs> yeah I, I i get most of mine from books um i quite quite honestly uh, i know it's supposed to be an oral medium but here in this um literate age then most of them i get from books um and there are lots of really good books of stories out there um so obviously you can go into bookshops and you can buy copies of the mabinogion and associated tales um, there's lots of sort of modern retellings of things that you get in um, sort of omnibus editions like oh, Celtic tales or Norse tales. There's a penguin book of Norse myths. Kevin Crossley Holland is a good writer who has done lots of um, collected editions of myths and folk tales. He does a, you know, a British folk tales one. Um, what's it called? Between Worlds. Between Worlds by Kevin Crossley Holland. That's That's a good sort of potted selection um the history press are a publisher who are doing an amazing series that goes around the uk county by county or, or sometimes not quite county like they do snowdonia rather than gwyneth um the national park which is broadly coterminous um but um yeah they're, and, and they're just a wonderful resource of of tales that you can just pour through all written by different people all written by oral storytellers as well um and obviously, you know, if you go to enough storytelling events, you you hear stories um, and some of them really stick out. And most storytellers really don't mind you going up to them afterwards and asking them to remind you of the details so that you can remember it and do it again another time. Um, the, the, most storytellers will be delighted that they get the opportunity to talk about it again with somebody who's really interested in it and who appreciated hearing it. Um, so, so just ask, definitely. That's cool. So I'm uh, conscious of time. So before we say goodbye, um, I want to tell viewers of this video, there's going to be a video of you telling part one of a finished tale. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for doing the audio on that. Yes. Uh, but would you want to tell people what you've got coming up in the in the near future? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, I'm really excited that um, as of uh tuesday the 26th of january um i will begin telling the four branches of the mabinogi which we've been talking about so much um online via zoom um so there are four interlinked tales you can listen you can hear them um independently separately or they you can hear it as a whole thing um i'm going to be telling one a week on tuesday successive tuesday nights starting on tuesday the 26th of january um and um yeah, like I say, you can you, you can get a ticket for just one or you can get a ticket that covers all of them and you, it won't affect your enjoyment at all. Um, and you can find information about that on uh, johnthestoryteller.com, 
which John, you're going to yeah, be along the do, do the business. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then coming up after, uh, in the middle of all that, um, uh, on Friday the fifth of um, February, I'm going to be doing a talk with stories um, for a library in London for um, Shum. Oh, what's it? I'm going to get the name wrong, so I won't try. But there will be details on there again because that is National Storytelling Week, possibly even International Storytelling Week. Actually, I should know. Um, and so um, Rachel Levy um, has asked me to do something for the libraries that she works for. Um, so that again will be online and free. That one will be. Um, so all details on my website, and I'm looking forward to it a lot. Well, John Mason, it's been a real pleasure. As <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure to have the opportunity to yak about all this stuff, which I normally don't get the chance to talk about. So it's, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.